Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to, uh, to be in the house of the Lord today. Uh, we welcome all of you. This Sunday morning, we want to uh, examine uh, what God has been speaking to us for centuries. The title of my message this morning is No Falling Words. No Falling Words. And my scripture lesson comes from Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45. And uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. You know, it's been almost 26 years ago that Lois and I uh, buried our 20-year-old son. You know what? We didn't see this coming. Friends rallied around our family, and my dear, dear friend, Pastor Ron Fusen, preached a powerful, encouraging message at Josh's funeral that simply said, God means you good and not harm. You know, we prayed for a miracle. I wanted Josh made new. I wanted to see his smile and his brilliance restored. And then for Lois and I to make a decision to uh, remove the blood pressure uh, medication. Uh, it was very, very difficult to do. We were in California, and at that time, uh, we could not tell them to remove the life support. But our dear friend and doctor out there said, you know, if that was my son, I would just tell him to remove the blood pressure medicine. She said, in, in 20 minutes, Josh will be gone. And uh, that's what we did. Never, ever been sorry for that. So, although that decision was very painful, we were confident in that we were doing the right thing and uh, laying him in the arms of a mighty God. He's the one who really knew our pain. And his best work uh, m might uh, not have been in restoring Josh to this life, but his assistance for Lois and me uh, to let God have him. Placing him in the mighty arms of God, he knew our pain. He knew our pain. And you know what? He made our son better than he ever was. He restored Josh to his eternal presence. You know what? That's his best work. You know, and this is not a, a lightweight hope. This was assurance. It's like he was saying to us, Let me have your son. Oh, I've got him now. God's children, reflecting the very nature of God, uh, became his presence around us. Our Lord, our God, our Savior got us through. You see, ladies and gentlemen, faith is a choice. I wanted to know, uh, how does a dad bury a son 
and then believed so deeply that God meant him good and not harm. That God had received his, his son into his loving arms. That God often does his best work in, in the hearts of sorrow. My heart could have, and Lois's as well, could have easily borne a, a different message. One of anger, bitterness, one of disappointment and despair, one full of hurt, even hate toward God. What made the difference? I think it's very simple. This grieving dad and mom believed God's promises. Faith is a choice. And I'm here to tell you it is. And promised land people risk the choice. When forced to stand at, at the crossroads of belief and unbelief, they chose belief. They placed one determined step after the other on the pathway of faith. We seldom run down that path of life with a skip. Usually we're going down it with a limp. But promised land people uh, make a, a conscious decision to step towards God, to lean into hope, and to heed the call of heaven. They press into the promises of God. And that's what we're looking at when we look at that book of Joshua. Joshua's story urges us to do likewise. In fact, one might argue that, that the central message of the book uh, is this headline. God keeps his promises. Trust him. And so we read again in Joshua chapter 21, verse 43. And so the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it and dwelled in it. The Lord gave them uh, rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of all their enemies and against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Josh 21, verses 43 through 45. These three verses are the theological heart of the book of Joshua. They rise up like, like trumpets at the end of the narrative. So we don't want to miss this. It's like God is saying, attention everyone, I'm keeping my word. And the writer of this pounds to the point and triplet it. Three times in these three verses, he declares God did what he said he would do. First one is this, that God gave all that he had sworn to give, verse 43. That God gave rest according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, verse 44. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken, all came to pass, verse 45. One commentator was so taken by that last statement that uh, uh, he titled his Joshua study, No Falling Words. That's where I got my title from, is that book. We live in a world of falling world, or falling words, don't we? Broken promises, empty vows, Pledges made that uh, only to be retracted. Assurances given and then ignored. Some were spoken with great fanfare. I'll always love you. 
calling on us to recognize your good work. Till death do us part. But those words tend to tumble. They're like autumn leaves in, in November's wind. And we've all, we've all heard our share of those falling words. But I'll tell you one thing, you'll never, ever hear them from God. In a word world of uh, falling words, God words remain. In a life of broken promises, he keeps his. The Lord's promises are sure. He speaks no careless word. All he says is purest truth, like silver seven times refined. Psalm 12, verse 6. And God is a covenant-keeping God. If you want proof, look to history. In Joshua 21, verse 43, it said, The Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers. Specifically, God gave Abraham a promise. And then in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, it said, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. That was 600 years earlier. Who would have believed it would happen? You know, when Abraham died, the only land that he owned was the land where Sarah was, bulk, was, was buried. That was it. A cemetery plot. His descendants were sharecroppers at best, slaves at worst. They were in Egypt for 400 years. And then Moses led them near Canaan, but never got them in. And how many grizzly bearded sons of Abraham looked to the stars and prayed? God, will you keep your promise? The answer from the pages of Joshua is simply yes. God promised to, to bless Abraham, and through Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. It says, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in, all, uh, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. This was a promise that was partially fulfilled in Joshua. And this is a promise completely, completely fulfilled in Jesus. In him... All the nations are blessed. In Jesus, every person has hope and the possibility of redemption. No wonder the Apostle Paul wrote, all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Our God is a promise-keeping God. Others might make a promise and then forget it. But if God makes a promise, he keeps it. In Hebrews ch chapter 10, verse 23, it says, he who promised is faithful. So does this matter? Does God, God's integrity, does it make a difference? Does his faithfulness come into play? I'll tell you what, when your son is on life support, it does. When you're pacing the floor back and forth, it does. When you're wondering what to do 
when it's every person's or every parent's worst nightmare, you have to choose. You have to choose faith or fear. God's purpose or random history? A God who knows and cares or a God who isn't there? You know, we all choose, all of us. Promised land people choose to promise, choose to trust God's promise. They choose to believe that, that God is up to something good, even though all that we see, all that we look at is bad. Nothing deserves your attention more than God's covenant. No words that are written on paper uh, will ever sustain you like the promises of God. So, do you really, do you know those promises? I'm going to give you just a handful here. In Psalm, verse 30, chapter 5. Or Psalm 30, verse 5. This is to the bereaved. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. To the besieged, Psalm 34, verse 19, says the righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. And then in Psalm verse 41, verse 3, this is to the sick. The Lord sustains them on their sick bed and restores them from their bed of illness. If you're lonely, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And even to the dying, John chapter 14, verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I go there to prepare a place for you. And even to the sinner, there's a promise. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. See, all of these promises are for our good. And because of his glory and excellence, uh, he's given us these great and precious promises. These are the, are the promises that enable you to, to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption that's caused by human desires. You'll find that in 2 Peter uh, verses one, chapter 1, verse 4. So we need to, to press into God's promises. When fears surface, respond with the thought, but God said. When doubts arise, but God said. When guilt overwhelms you, but God said. And we need to declare those words. You have rescued me, O oh, oh God, who keeps his promises. Psalms uh, chapter 31, verse 5. So we can turn again and again to, to, uh, to God's spoken covenants. We need to, to search the scriptures like a miner that's, that's digging for gold. And once you find a nugget, Hang on to it. Trust it. Take it to the bank. Let me give you an example. Do what I did with, uh, with the promise of a pilot. We were flying into Amsterdam, and we had had a horrible flight. Horrible, horrible flight. Storms. 
It's all delayed by the storms. And we landed in, in uh, Amsterdam at the exact time that my flight was scheduled to leave. And I began thinking about who I can call, trying to figure out, well, where am I going to get a hotel for the night and those kind of things. And uh, grumbling. Now my flight is going to be delayed. And then over the loudspeaker came a promise. This is the pilot. And I know that many of you have connections. He said, relax. Relax. You will make them. We're holding your planes. We have a place for you. And I thought to myself, you know what? He wouldn't say that unless he meant it. So I decided to just trust his promise. I stopped thinking about hotels. I quit checking my watch. And I relaxed. I waited my turn to get off the, of the plane. And I set my set sights on, on the gate. And I marched right through that concourse with confidence. After all, hadn't that pilot given me a promise? There were other people in the airport that weren't so fortunate. They were also from different planes and coming through the same inclement weather. And it seemed like they were all in panic. Travelers were scrambling and uh, white-faced and worried. You know. And their expressions betrayed their fear. You know, I got to think, it's too bad that their pilot hadn't spoken to them. Or maybe he had, and they weren't listening. Well, I'm telling you, your pilot has spoken to you. And me. But will you listen? I mean, really listen. Let his promises settle over you like the warmth of a summer day. When everything and everyone around you says to panic, choose the path of peace. In this world of, of falling words, broken promises. Do yourself a favor and take hold of the promises of God. Years ago, my friend Wes did. you look a long time before you'll find a better man than Wes Bishop. He had a quick smile, a warm handshake, and in fact, he and I were alike in many ways because he had a, a, a serious uh, uh, weakness for ice cream. <laughs> for more than 35 years, he kept the same job, railroad man, loved the same wife, served the same church, lived in the same house, and he was a pillar in that small little community of Davisburg. I don't recall that, that Wes ever missed a day of work until he was diagnosed with brain cancer. Christians all around uh, prayed and asked God to remove it. And for a time it appeared that he had. But then the symptoms returned with a vengeance. In a matter of a few weeks, he's, he was immobilized at home, and hospice was called to him. 
had three sons, and they took care of uh, uh, keeping a vigil uh, with their mom. They placed a baby monitor next to uh, Wes's bed. And though he had hardly spoken a word in days, they wanted to make sure that if he spoke, that they would hear him and they could go to his aid. And one night he did. But he didn't call for help. He called for Christ. Isn't that something? I've not known many people like that. But about one o'clock in the morning, the youngest son heard the strong voice of his father on the monitor. This is pretty much what dad said. Jesus, I want to thank you for my life. You have been so good to me. And I want you to know that when you're ready to take me, I am ready to go. One day later, he died. That was, that was the last words that, that Wes spoke. I'm just telling you that little story because that's the kind of faith that I want. That's what I want. Don't you want that kind of faith? The faith that turns to God in the darkest hour. The faith that praises God with the weakest body. The kind of faith that trusts God with his promises. It's a kind of faith that declares faith is a choice and I choose faith. Father, this morning I pray God that you would Enable us through our heart, through our spirits, Lord, to have that same kind of faith that takes us through the storms of life and gives us peace in the midst of that of that storm. Today, I pray that you would bless us and encourage us, Father, in Jesus' name.